Bienvenidos. Welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. My name is Juliana, although some people know me as Achira, and this is La Guerrerita. I carry all of my stories in here, and together she and I sometimes travel the world scattering stories like seeds. But today I'm speaking to you from home, from the beautiful mountains around Medellin in Colombia, South America. This is where I'm from. And Colombians in general don't travel that much. So generally when I'm in faraway lands, I'm quite often the first Colombian that people have ever met. And of course, hearing that I'm a storyteller, people always ask me for a Colombian story. So to begin, it is quite proper after all, because this is a story about the beginning. I'm going to tell you a Colombian story that I love very much. In the very beginning, there were no oceans, no rivers, no rain, but there was Marina. And Marina was the most beautiful woman who had ever walked the face of the earth because she was a woman made entirely out of water. And everybody loved Marina. But the one who loved Marina the most was Marino. Marino was a strong, handsome young man whose body was made entirely out of salt. And Marina and Marino loved each other so much that nothing could bring them apart. Nothing except the sun. Because you see, the sun wanted Marina for himself. And he couldn't understand why Marina had chosen Marino. I mean, who cared about salt? Salt was worthless. He was the sun. Why didn't she want him? He was so powerful. He was so hot. So when finally he realized that Marina was not going to go with him, he decided to take her whether she wanted it or not. Because she didn't know what was best for her. He did. And she would thank him later. But when Marina heard that the sun was coming for her, she and Marino held hands and they ran all night to get away from the sun. But they didn't make it to the caves in time. And the sun rose like it always does and Marina and Marino were trapped in a huge expansive plain that stretched from horizon to horizon without even a shadow to hide under. The sun started reaching for Marina, but Marino held on to her so, so, so tight. They became one, one huge body of water mixed with salt that stretched from horizon to horizon as far as the eye could see. And that is how the first oceans came about. But the sun was not going to give up so easily. And so the sun started heating and heating and pulling on Marina. And Marina started feeling her body becoming lighter and lighter and rising up into the sky. Marino tried to hold on to her. She tried to hold on to Marino, but the sun was too strong. And Marina was ripped away from the one she loved, from her home, from everything she'd ever known. But just as she was about to be devoured by the sun's blazing heat, the sun's enemy saw what was happening. Now, usually when I say the sun's enemy, people think that I'm talking about the moon, but no. The sun's enemy is the wind. The wind is always blowing clouds in front of the sun's face in order to hide him and make people forget that the sun exists at all. So when the wind saw that the sun was about to obtain what he wanted most, the wind would make sure that the sun could never get it. And so the wind began to blow with all the force of the gale of the hurricane. The sun tried to hold on to Marina, but he felt her slipping out of his clutches. Marina was blown back and forth, back and forth, until finally she slipped through the fingers of the sun and fell and was dashed to pieces against the rocks of the highest mountains. She was completely and utterly destroyed and her body was broken into a million tiny droplets that scattered all over the earth. And yet, she did not die. 
because Marina's love was so strong that every single little broken piece of her body started finding its way back home, sneaking through the cracks and crevices of the rocks, dropping from the highest cliffs down, 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 further and further, looking for its way to the sea. And every time one little broken piece of her body met up with another tiny droplet, they joined together. And over time, she became bigger and stronger and more powerful until she turned into a rivulet and then a stream and then a river, laughing and dancing and splashing and singing all the way back to the sea where Marina was waiting for her with open arms. They were together and they were safe until the next day when the sun rose again. And once again, the sun heated, and once again, the wind blew, and once again, Marina was dashed against the rocks. And so it continues over and over and over again to this day. But no matter how many times Marina is dashed against the rocks and broken into a million pieces, she always, always puts herself back together and always finds her way back home. And since she is so full of life and hope, her death, her destruction, became life for everyone else. Because everywhere a broken piece of her body touches, new life springs up. And that is why we have flowers and fruit trees. That is why, to this day, they say that why up in the mountains, the wind blows so strong and why down by the seashore, the sun is so hot. That's also why they say to this day, why you and me, the children of Marina and Marino, when we cry, whether it's out of sadness or joy, the tears that come from deep inside of us, they're a mixture so that we will always remember that we are made of water, salt, and so much love. I just love that story. It's so full of ancient ancestral wisdom. And I was so happy to find it too because it's so difficult to find true, authentic, traditional Colombian stories. Because when the Spaniards came, our stories were taken from us. And since then, in Colombia, we pretty much grew up on Greek myths and the Brothers Grimm. Now, this is a story that's told a lot in Colombia. Many different storytellers tell it all over the country. And I've heard uh, conflicting sources. I know it was an indigenous tale, of course, but I heard some people say that it came from the Carib people on the Caribbean coast, and others say that it was from the Waju nation on the desert peninsula to the north. So I asked the, my teacher, the director of my storytelling school, I heard the story originally from him, if he knew exactly where the story came from. And he said, oh, yes, I wrote it. Huh. Because it was like, ah, oh, I wanted so badly for this to be an ancient story, you know, to have survived the passage of time and war. But I guess it's just as well. Because if your stories are taken from you, then go out and make your own. So I'm going to tell you a story about an encounter I had on one of my travels, long before I knew you could be a storyteller. But I've always loved stories. My family was Christian, so I grew up on stories of the Bible, you know, David and Goliath and all those magical tales from faraway lands. And so I've always been fascinated, absolutely fascinated with the land of Israel. Now, when I was 18, the opportunity came up for me to be able to go to Israel, actually, for a month and uh, study Hebrew there. I had some savings. I took off. It was the first trip that I'd done out of my own initiative by myself. And I loved it. I absolutely fell in love with that, with that country and decided that I wanted to go back, that I had to go back and volunteer and stay for an entire year. So just a few years later, I did. I had very little money, but I was volunteering at a place where I, uh, you know, I, everything was organized. But some very strange things happened on that trip. And eventually, for reasons that even I don't understand, I ended up being kicked out of the place I was volunteering at and found myself on the streets. But I couldn't go back to Colombia because 
my flight wasn't for another two months and changing the date would cost a whole bunch of money that I did not have. And also, of course, I had the hope that somehow or other, sooner or later, things would resolve themselves in the place where I'd been and I would be able to return. But I couldn't just sit still and not do anything in the meantime. And besides, this was Israel, right? So much to see and do. So I decided to travel to visit all those different places that I'd grown up hearing about. The only thing is, I did not have money. Because the money I did have, I had to save. I could not spend it because I didn't know how long I was going to be able to stay and, and what I was going to need it for. So I had to make sure that it lasted. So if I paid the entrance to a museum or to a historical site that day, for instance, I knew that I couldn't eat. It was one or the other. Um, or if I paid public transportation to get a bus somewhere, then there was no way I could pay a hostel. So it was an adventure, very much of an adventure. Before all of this happened, I had actually learned to hitchhike thanks to a crazy Jewish couch surfer. It's another story for another time. And I'd also learned, this is definitely a story for another time, that you can sleep outside in a park on the street and not die. So I packed my bag and I took off. And I would stand by the side of the road with my hand out. And sooner or later, because that's the law of the road, somebody would always stop. And sometimes, just for the fun of it, uh, they would ask, where, where was I going? And I would say, well, I don't even know. Where are you going? Fine, let's go there. Never heard of it. Let's see this. And I traveled around that way for a long time. And it was absolutely fascinating. And I saw so many things and met so many amazing people and had so many wonderful experiences. But now that I look back, I realize that it was also very hard because I was alone. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I went very hungry, very hungry all the time. And I was in a lot of danger too, many times, especially as a woman sleeping on the streets. And I was always tired. I always had to sleep with one eye open, of course, and yeah, now I realize it was really hard. I remember one night I would arrived in Haifa. Haifa is a city on the Mediterranean Sea, and I was wandering around with my heavy backpack. It had gotten late, and I hadn't found a decent place to sleep. It was around 9 p.m. by then, and I didn't know where to go. I was kind of in the middle of no, there was nobody around, right? Finally, a little bit further down the road, I saw a woman with two young children waiting for waiting at the bus stop. So I went up to her to ask for a park or something around close by that I could hide behind a bush and get some rest. And I know this is going to sound strange. I'm not lesbian, but she was the most beautiful, absolutely gorgeous woman I have ever seen in my entire life. She was an Ethiopian Jew who had immigrated to, to Israel recently. Her name was Zara. And she didn't speak any English. I spoke very broken Hebrew. So I did my best to explain the situation. Well, first of all, I asked if there was a park. And she said, why a park at this time of night? And so I did my best to explain the situation. And immediately she said, no, 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 no. Come stay at my house. I thought, I mean, there's an expression in Spanish that's, which is que pena. I don't really know how to translate it into English, but it's, it's a feeling of, of embarrassment, of shame almost. And that's how I felt because she didn't know me and I had nothing to offer her. And not only that, but she was a woman alone with two small children. She was putting herself at risk by inviting a stranger to stay in her house. But I really needed a place to stay. So I went with her and that night, um, I had some little crafts, some gifts that I brought from Colombia. I gave them to her children, and we stayed up talking for a little while. She told me a little bit about her life. And there was one thing that she insisted on very, very much, which was that the next day, tomorrow, she had to get up early to go work. She had to leave at 6 a.m., but that I could stay and sleep in as late as I wanted, and that when she returned, she would prepare a special traditional dish from Ethiopia. 
so that we could share. But I said, no, no. How could I, a stranger, stay at your house while you're not here? Que pena. I would be ashamed. I'll go with you at 6 a.m. And so the next morning I got up early and we left. And I never saw her again. What I needed more than anything else in the world right then was to be able to sleep in as late as I wanted and to be able to eat a home-cooked meal from Ethiopia, a real meal, not a piece of moldy dry bread that I found in the garbage somewhere. But I said no, because I didn't want to be a bother, a burden, because I felt bad. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that what she needed most more than anything in the world was for me to stay because she was lonely. She was alone in a country that where she didn't know anybody, where she wasn't always welcome because there's still a lot of racism, of course. And what she needed most was to have someone there to share a meal with, to talk to, even if just a little bit. And I denied her that blessing. I had been sent to her just as much as she had been sent to me. And I said no. And sometimes we have exactly, I have exactly what you need and you have exactly what I need. And if only we could come together, we could change the world. And we don't do it. I said no because I didn't want to bother her. I didn't want to be an inconvenience, a burden. And I didn't realize that I too was a blessing. And that I too, just by being me, had so much to give. And that night, once again, same old story of wandering around Haifa, trying to find somewhere to be able to get some rest. And if I could go back and do things differently, I would. But I did learn something from that experience. Not always, of course. I still sometimes fall back in that trap of thinking that I'm a burden, that I'm a bother. But I'm no longer as afraid to receive things with my hands open. Because I've learned that I too could be exactly what you need. And that I have so much to give as well. And the road taught me that every time we receive, we give. And every time we give, we receive. Living on the streets was one of the best experiences I could have ever had. It was very hard, of course, but it also showed me a strength that I didn't know I had. And it taught me that the road provides. All you have to do is ask and keep your hands open. Not only that, but I'm also not as afraid anymore of what life can throw at me. Because if I could handle that, I could handle almost anything. And it's only gotten easier since. Because by the, to by the time I took my next trip, I'd already discovered storytelling. And oh, that was a game changer. I started in Mexico, and the, what I did was that I would put on a colorful dress, some face paint, a great big smile, and I would show up at one of the parks, look around, see somebody sitting on a bench, come up to them, say, I am a traveling storyteller from Colombia, and I have brought a story just for you. Would you like to hear it? And more often than not, they would. And more often than not, they would like the story. And they would give me something in exchange. And after a few days of busking, I would have enough to keep on traveling, go to the next place. And I made it all the way back to Medellin, Colombia, all through Central America over six, over six months, paying my way just by stories. And 
Interestingly, that's exactly the same way it works here. Because the World Storytelling Cafe has come up with the ingenious idea of the virtual hat. That one you see right down below the screen, that one is connected directly to our, well, my, my PayPal in this, uh, in this case. All the storytellers have that. And it's really cool because that way we can bring everything together as well. You see, we have the stories. You have the boredom of having to stay quarantined in your house for weeks. This time, we really are coming together, and we can make something beautiful. And if you would like to give me something in exchange, well, I'm going to save it all up, everything I make from here, and when all this madness is over and we can hit the road again, well, I'll take the stories back out, and who knows? Maybe the road will lead me to you. And speaking of the road, I'm going to tell you a story about a journey that we will all take at some point or another. Here in Colombia, the entire country is on lockdown. People are only allowed out once a day to walk their dogs for 10 minutes. As you can imagine, the people who have dogs have been renting them out and making a killing. And the people who don't have dogs, this could only happen in Colombia, have been caught walking stuffed animals. So in honor of that, I'm going to tell you a story about a dog. Well, about a man and his dog, or a dog and his man, however you want to say it. And I don't know the man's name, so I'll call him John, because that's the typical name of all characters in these very ancient stories. I don't even know where this story comes from. I've heard it from many different places. And it just so happens that John and Dog were... Oh, I know. I'll call the dog Toby, because that is the only name that dogs have in Colombia. Every single male dog in Colombia is named Toby. So, John and Toby were walking down the road when suddenly... A terrible storm hit. The most horrendous thunderstorm you could ever imagine. They had never seen anything like it. Great big hail was falling and pretty soon it felt as if it were snowing, but it wasn't snowing because it was hitting them on the heads and they were in the middle of nowhere. So further down the road, John saw a great big tree and said, Toby, bottom, 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 let's go, let's go. Now for those of you who know anything about storms, that is a bad idea. Never, never hide under a tree in a thunderstorm. John, however, did not know that. Toby, of course, didn't either. So they ran to the tree. They uh, were protected a little bit from the hail. And guess what happened? Lightning struck. It struck the tree. It struck John. It struck Toby. And it killed them so fast that they didn't even realize they were dead. So they waited out the storm, and when it stopped raining, they kept on walking. But it didn't take them too long to realize that something was off. I mean, they'd been walking and walking and walking for a long time and weren't really seeming to get anywhere. Maybe that was it. Or maybe it was that beautiful, heavenly music they could hear in the distance. Over there, where the rainbow seemed to melt Well, they didn't know anything about a rainbow melting into a valley or having the music, but might as well check it out. There was nothing else to do, right? So they picked up their pace, walked a little bit faster, and finally John and Toby reached the valley, and down at the bottom of the valley was the most exquisite city made entirely out of gold great walls that gleamed and glistened in the sunlight, almost blinded them. The gates were these two huge pearls. The rainbow went from one side to the other of the walled city, and the heavenly music came directly from there. John and Zoe looked at each other, thought, mm, well, there was nowhere else to go, so they went down to the city, and as soon as they arrived, the great curled gates flew open, and an old man with a long beard and a pristine white robe stepped out and said, Oh, John, welcome. We have been waiting for you. Come in. Now, by then, John and Toby were pretty tired and pretty thirsty and pretty hungry, and John could see through the great pearl gates, streets made of glass, people playing harps, all dressed in white, 
but the best thing of all, a beautiful crystal clear fountain with precious water and great banquet tables loaded with the best food in the world. John thought, ah, this is great. And, 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 and where are we though? <laughs> John, what do you mean, where are we? Don't you recognize it? This is heaven, and I, of course, am St. Peter. John started connecting the dogs' wheels, started turning, remembering the storm. Bobby, we're dead? John, who matters? What, what does it matter to be dead? If you have this, come on in. The food is going to get cold. Well... There's nowhere else to go, right? So John said, eh, I guess it could be worse. Come on, Toby. But instantly, ah, 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 ah. dogs don't go to heaven, John. What? What do you mean dogs don't go to heaven? What are you talking about? Toby's a better person than I am. Didn't even Disney make a movie about that? Of course all dogs go to heaven. Ridiculous. Get out of the way. No, John. We have a place for you at the table. We have your harp, we have your golden crown, we have eternity of bliss, but the dog stays here. You're kidding me. Come on. I mean, look, we can always solve this some way or another, right? 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 <coughs> okay, fine. No bribes. But look, he's a little dog. I'll hide him. You don't have to tell your boss. Nobody has to know. He, he, he doesn't even bark. Right, Toby? No. Okay, look, 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 look. No. And even though John pleaded and begged and screamed and cried and threw himself on the floor and did everything he could, St. Peter said, no, dogs do not go to heaven. So finally, furiously, John said, fine, you can keep your stupid heaven. We're going to hell. <laughs> Come on, Toby. And John and Toby kept walking. The gates closed behind him, but John did not care. He was so angry. He didn't care if he was going to spend the rest of his eternity in flames. But it didn't seem like there were flames anywhere, so he just kept walking. And they walked and walked and walked. And finally they were so tired and so thirsty. But then... Further down the road, there was a tree, very similar to the one where they had just come from, but it wasn't raining or thundering now, so it shouldn't be a problem. And there's nowhere else to go. So they kept on walking, and when they reached the tree, well, got closer anyway, they saw that there, well, first of all, they heard it, right? They heard that there was like this little trickling musical sound. Water. There was a stream bubbling up, a spring bubbling up from the roots of the tree. And then as they got even closer, they saw that tied under the tree was this fabulous hammock. And lying in the hammock was a man with a hat over his face. Well, John and Toby tiptoed in wondering if the man was going to say the dogs couldn't come here either, and tried to sneak over to the spring and drink a little bit of the water. But instantly the man would go, Oh, oh, oh guests! Oh, come in, come in, please. There's plenty of water. Do you, would you like anything to eat? John waited a moment and said, What about my dog? Well, yes, of course. Here are all... All living creatures with a good heart are welcome. Come, sit down. And the man clapped his hands, and suddenly there appeared a picnic blanket with the most delicious foods you could imagine. Very simple, not all rich and fancy like back in, in the Golden City, but, but very, very delicious. And there was even a plate of dog biscuits. Well, Toby, at the time of his life, and... They even, of course, gave him some chicken bones and some other things. And and John and the man stayed talking for a while. And Toby afterwards started chasing butterflies and barking. And, and after a while, 
some more people came with their pet cats and parakeets and even somebody with a goldfish tank and somebody even had a kangaroo. And pretty soon, under the tree was full of people and the, magically the picnic blanket always had enough for everyone. And John felt perfectly content and happy. And he said, you know, I didn't think hell would feel like this. The man in the hammock just, <laughs> hell? What are you talking about? This is heaven. Huh? But, 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 but I just came from, you know, the golden city with the rainbow and the wings and stuff and the pearly gates and the... Oh, that! No, 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 no. That's hell. Huh? But St. Peter said, St. Pete, that's Satan, John. He just dresses up like that to deceive travelers. Ooh! So you mean, if I had gone in, mm -hmm. all the gold, all the food, all the water would have disappeared, you would have found yourself in torment, in flames, in torture, forever. Ooh! Well, that's a good thing I didn't go in then. But, 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 but that's dangerous. I mean, you know, somebody should stop them because people are going to go there thinking it's heaven and get trapped. What a terrible mistake. The man just smiled kindly at John. No, John. No mistake. No mistake at all. Because the only people who enter that place are the ones who are willing to leave their friends behind. I have never left a friend behind. But sometimes I've forgotten myself. Sometimes I've left myself behind. And honestly, that's kind of what I'm doing now. Because you see, a cheetah she didn't come back with me from the last journey. She got lost somewhere along the way. Three years ago, when I came back to Colombia, I stopped telling stories. To all intents and purposes, it would seem like the stories are dead. But maybe, maybe they're just seeds. And the fact that you can't see them, the fact that they've been buried deep under the ground, maybe that doesn't mean that they're not there. They're waiting, like we are, waiting for it to be safe enough to come back out. I'm telling you this because stories must always, always be honest. It feels strange to tell stories. My heart isn't in them like it was on the road. But one of the great storytellers that I met along the way, Shana Lee of the Drutsila tradition, she's here at the World Storytelling Cafe as well. She taught me that it is our responsibility as storytellers to hold the stories, but it is your responsibility as listener to ask for them. And so when John Rowe called me up out of the blue after years of not speaking and told me that he had this amazing project called the World Storytelling Cafe and would I please share some stories, Achita was called upon. Because now that the world is standing still, people are asking for stories. And that's why I'm here. For you. Yes, you. You who are listening to me right now, you are the reason I'm here. Because you asked for a story. I can't see you, I don't know your name, I don't know what you need to hear right now. But I am here. I'm going to tell you a story that in a way hurts to tell right now. Because we always have less time than we think. But sometimes... We need to be reminded, and it's not too late yet. Cut. Nestled deep in the mountains of Argentina somewhere, there is a little village with the kindest, friendliest, 
warmest people in the world. And a traveler stumbled upon this village by mistake one day, and he was surprised because he felt home. And he had traveled so long and so far and so wide that he had forgotten what home felt like. Now, he loved traveling, of course, but he was old now, and he was tired. And he realized that it wouldn't be that bad to settle down for a while. But before he did that, of course, he wanted to get to know the place really, really well. So he explored every nook and cranny, wandered every street, didn't take him that long, it was quite small. And finally, ended up at the top of a small hill overlooking the entire village. I was beautiful up there. The breeze was just perfect. There was this great big fruit tree with uh, full of birds and flowers. But there was something strange about the hill. And that is that there were all these rocks around. What was even stranger, though, was that on a second look, the rocks had writing on them. Now, he was curious, as all travelers are, so he started bending down to read what was written on the rocks. And then he realized, ah, this is the cemetery. Now, of course, it made perfect sense, but he just hadn't recognized it because he was used to cemeteries being so dreary and depressing. But this one was full of light and life. Well, he knew that sometimes the best stories are written in the past, so he started reading all the different tombstones. Now, that's when he started feeling sad, though. Because on the first tombstone, underneath the name, it said, lived for eight years, six months, and two days. And he was sad for that because he loved children. And it was terrible to think that one was not able to enjoy life the way he had. But what made him even sadder was that right next to it, from the same family, must have been a little girl, his sister or something, underneath the name it said, lived for seven years and 12 months and 14 days. And then he realized that the tombstone after that said, lived for four years and eight months and nine days. And then he really started getting worried. And almost frantically, he started rushing around, reading all the tombstones. And to his horror, he did not find a single one who had lived more than 13 years. And he couldn't believe it. What terrible curse had come upon this beautiful, wonderful village? How could these people, who were so kind and open and friendly, have had to bury an entire generation of their children? What had happened here? And just then, he saw a young couple climbing the steep steps of the hill, bringing fresh flowers to put on a new grave, and he approached them with tears in his eyes and said, I'm so sorry. No parent should ever have to bury their child. I'm so sorry that you lost your son. But to his surprise, they laughed. <laughs> You're not from around here, traveler, are you? said the woman. Look. He wasn't my son, he was my grandfather, and he died at the ripe old age of 82. What are you talking about? It says here on the tombstone that he only lived for nine years. Ah, yes, and nine years well spent. But you see, we have a custom in our village, and it's this one. And carefully, she pulled over her head a golden chain that she wore around her neck, and attached to the bottom of the chain, there was a little book. As she opened the book and flipped through the pages, he saw the first few pages were covered in neat, tiny handwriting, and the remaining pages were blank. These are the books of our lives, traveler. In them, we write down every single moment in which we feel truly happy. And after that, we write down how long that moment lasts. Everyone in the village has one, and when someone dies, whatever age they may be. We, instead of putting their age, we take their books and we add up all the different times written in them. And that is what we put on the tombstone. Because here we believe that the time in which we are truly happy, it's the only time that we really live.
I told this story to a man in London once. And to my great surprise, he said, I don't agree. I never encountered that reaction before. People were always telling me that they felt that this story was a wake-up call, a, a reminder to seek happiness in everything that they did. But this man said, no, no, he said. I've lived a great many experiences in my life, and I would not change them, not even the sad ones, because they have made me who, we are, who I am. And that really made me think. Right now, the days that we are living probably, usually, could not be considered happy, really. But they are certainly part of our lives. And we certainly are living interesting times. The world that we have built is crumbling around outside us. And when all this is over and we go back out, the world that we will find will be very different. Better or worse, I cannot say, but certainly different. I started my tales with a story about the beginning. It's only fitting, then, that I finish with a story about the end. This is a story about the end of the world, but not our world, the world that came before ours. And the Yurakare people of Bolivia are the only ones who remember this story. They still live in the same place that they have lived for thousands, if not even more years, in the jungles of the Amazon. Jungle that is so thick that it takes a raindrop ten full minutes to reach the ground and where the sun can barely squeeze its way through. You see, a very, very, very long time ago, so long ago that only they remember, Sararuma, the evil one, broke his constraints and came from beyond where the sun meets the earth, where the sky connects with the land. He cannot die, and so he likes to kill the things that can. And... As he blew through the jungles and through the plains and the lands, he found the Yurakare people with their beautiful fruit trees that were sweet smelling that attracted animals that they could hunt. No, 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 no. No one could be happy if he could not. And so he set fire to all of their crops. Now, if Sararuma had only set fire to the trees, the world would have been spared because all of the Yurakare people would have come together to put out the flames. But instead, when the people rushed down to the river to fill their gourds with water, Sararuma billowed before them and said, them, pointing to the people on the other side. They were the ones that set fire to your trees. They want to destroy you. And that was all he had to do. Consumed by rage and desire for revenge, the people dropped their gourds, left the trees burning, and jumped into their canoes to race across the river and set fire to the houses of the others. And soon the entire world was a blaze. Only two people survived, a woman and a man. They had begged their leaders to make peace, but as the atrocities committed by both sides went beyond the point of no return and beyond forgiveness, and as revenge was heaped upon revenge, finally they realized that there was no way to stop it, and the only way they could survive was to hide. And so they gathered enough food for many, many, many days. And they went deep into a hole under the ground. From the darkness of their hole, the man and woman could see the flames licking the night sky, hear the, ac hear the cries of the dying and smell the acrid scent of smoke. And they waited. There's nothing heavier than the waiting, is there? You want to be out there doing something, fighting. But the only way to survive the end of the world is to 
sit still. And the waiting nearly drove them mad, because the hole they were in was small and cramped and dark. They had no other company than each other and their own fears. But they stayed. And finally, after many days, all was silent. Eagerly, the man crawled his way to the surface, but even though he yarned for the freedom of fresh air, he was careful because he was smart. And so first he stretched out a twig. Instantly, the twig burst into flames. It is too soon. And so he crawled back into the hole to wait again. The next day, his wife tried, but once again, the twig smoldered. Eight more days they tried until finally, on the tenth day, the twig did not burn or smolder. And carefully, they clawed their way to the surface, blinking their eyes in the sunlight, and stepped out into the world. Ashes everywhere. Suddenly, Sararuma swirled around them. The entire world is destroyed. Now, you too will die. No. We will plant. It will rain. We will have children. Things will change. And we will start again. And as the woman and man stood tall and unafraid, Sararuma disappeared. The dreamer awakes, the shadow passes by. When I tell you a tale, the tale is a lie. But listen closely, brave maiden, kind youth. The tale is a lie, but what it tells is the truth. Thank you for listening to my stories. Now go out and live your own. People, wherever you are, thank you for listening to that last storyteller. What an amazing performance. And if you enjoyed it, the hat, look just below the story. If you're on the website, and I do encourage you to go to the website, and you can put a little in the hat. If you're in Texas, you've got a Texas hat. Got this in Kerrville. You could drop a dollar in, or two. If you're in England, you can drop a pound in, or more. If you're in Canada, well, you could drop a few count of dollars in. And maybe if you're right up north in Lapland, you could drop a few kroner in, or maybe a euro or two. It will be much appreciated. Thank you. Don't forget the hat and enjoy the stories.